So then I'm going to switch to English and say welcome to Joseph Green and Vicky Whittemore. And do you think you could introduce yourself? You have so many titles and such complex work descriptions that I'm afraid to stumble. So I would be appreciated if you could introduce yourself. Sure, thank you, Trudy. I'm Vicki Whittemore, and I work in the Division of Neuroscience at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke at the National Institutes of Health, where I oversee the ME-CFS research program, as well as grants on epilepsy. Joe? Hi, um, thank you, Trudy. My name is Joe Breen. I'm my day job, so to speak, is in the basic immunology branch where I oversee a portfolio of immunology grants and all different types. And I'm also the point of contact and have the grant portfolio for MECFS for NIAID for the research grants outside of uh, NIH. It's a pleasure to be here today. Over. So it's really wonderful to be here with all of you today. Let me just fix my video. All right, so we're, we're thrilled to be with all of you and I miss seeing many of you who come usually to the Invest in ME conference in the UK. Hopefully we'll be able to join and join each other and um, get together next fall or next spring in England. So here's an outline of what we plan to talk about today. We'll just talk a little bit about an overview of NIH itself, MECFS research at NIH, the intramural clinical studies, a little bit about the collaborative research centers, investigator initiated research that's supported by NIH, and then end with information about our recover initiative to study long COVID or post acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2. So the mission of NIH is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health, length, and life, and reduce illness and disability. So this research really covers everything from very basic research through translational research into clinical research and clinical trials across all of the different areas of research that NIH supports. So NIH is just one of 11 agencies within the US Department of Health and Human Services. And the congressional appropriation for NIH was $45 billion in fiscal year 22. And there was $1 billion appropriated to establish a new advanced research projects agency for health to drive forward high risk, high reward research. And I just saw that this, um, this week that the director of that agency has just been appointed by the president. And so that agency will really bring to light, I think some really high profile, high risk, high reward research going forward. It will be very interesting to see how that agency will partner and work together with NIH. So at NIH, there are 27 institutes and centers, and each institute has different mission and priorities, a different budget, different funding strategies, and different cultures. Um, I have to say it's just been one of the best parts of my career to be able to work with Joe at NIAID. We've really formed, I think, a great partnership in, in working together on all of the MECFS activities supported by NIH. So NIH support for MECFS research is shown here, and you can see back in 2014, 2015, even 2016, there was relatively little in terms of funding going to MECFS research between five and eight million. The jump in 2017 was a result of our support for three collaborative research centers and the data coordinating center. And you can see the research has stayed pretty stable till then, until 2021, the increase there is actually in new investigator-initiated research, so research that's supported by NIH, but actually outside of the collaborative centers. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So NIH support for MECFS research in 
fiscal year 21, which is our last fiscal year, which is when we have the last official numbers, totaled almost $17 million. And you can see in this pie, pie graph that 7,000 of or 42% of that funding was actually going to the centers. 34% was going to researchers outside of NIH and about 4 million to the intramural investigators or the research on MECFS that's actually happening on the campus of NIH. So Joe and I are part and help Dr. Cora Schatz to organize and lead the Trans NIH MECFS Working Group. And this working group had existed before 2015, but was really reinvigorated in 2015 by Dr. Collins when he started asking, what are we doing for research on MECFS? And the office was moved from another place at NIH to NINDS. And we have representatives from 22 institutes who work together on this working group. Um, and in 2016, we issued administrative supplements to existing grants. In 2017, we issued the first request for applications for the centers and the data coordinating center. In 20, fiscal year 20, we put out a renewal of program announcements or funding announcements for MECFS in general. And this year we reissued the RFAs for the centers and the data coordinating center. And those applications will go to review in November um, with funding then to be announced in February. We're also in the midst of developing a research strategic plan for MECFS. And with this plan, we would want to develop a research plan to stimulate and support research on MECFS in priority areas. So how can we really move from where we are now to clinical trials to treatments for individuals with MECFS? So the planning committee will include healthcare providers, researchers, individuals with MECFS and advocates and will be established as a working group of our advisory council. And the rationale there is then the recommendations that come from this working group will really have teeth in that they'll, they'll be actually a recommendation from the council to Dr. Koroshetz that will then allow us to really act on those recommendations going forward. So NIH research on MECFS, as I said, there's a lot of research going on intramurally, so at, in the laboratories on or near the NIH campus, as well as those grants that are funded outside NIH. And those are primarily what we call R01s, which are five-year grants or two-year R21 grants, and the as well as then the five-year collaborative research centers and the data coordinating center. So the intramural collaboration, um, as I think many of you are very familiar with this very deep phenotyping study that was put in place in the intramural program by Dr. Avinath, who's the clinical director at NINDS, and Brian Wallet, who's working in partnership with him. And the primary objective was to explore the clinical biological phenotypes of post-infectious MECFS, and secondarily to explore pathophysiologies of fatigue and post-exertional malaise. And lastly, to develop an experimental model of MECFS using neurons from induced pluripotent stem cells or using actual cells from individuals with MECFS to be able to study them in the lab to try to identify what is going wrong in the function of those cells. So it, they have completed phase one, which is this first deep phenotyping phase. The studies are complete. Data analysis is actually still ongoing. However, they're very close to submitting the first publication um, for a review and publication soon. And they're working on several other publications that will be coming out of this. I think one of the important things that we're working on with them is to have all of the data that they've developed shared in the tool MAP MECFS, which is a tool that our data coordinating center developed, where data can be openly shared with other investigators so that they can access the data and do additional analysis with that data. 
And if anyone's interested in looking at investigators or clinicians who may be on this call, if you're interested in looking at the data that's available in MAP MECFS, you can send an email or go to that website and send an email and request access for an account. So as I said, phase one is completed. They're hoping to move into phase two and have already started to look at some biomarkers to be used in a longitudinal study and are already also thinking about some early phase intervention studies or clinical trials to be put forward utilizing the support of NIH and the extensive expertise that's available in our intramural program. So additional studies that they're taking undertaking really using the same or very similar protocol to that being used in MECFS is to study Gulf War illness. Um, and this is being done in partnership and funded by the Veterans Administration to look at really what is, why are so many of our veterans who participated in the Gulf War still ill? And it's, it's very interesting. Many of them have very overlapping symptoms with MECFS. In addition, they're also undertaking a similar protocol to look at long COVID. And here, their initial recruitment and screening is in progress, and they are going to start bringing some of these individuals onto campus for the actual test, extensive testing in the very near future. So I think this is where I turn it over to you, Joe. Uh, thanks, Vicki. So um, this is a a listing of the collaborative research centers that, as Vicki mentioned, were supported initially in 2017 and are uh, planned, the program is planning for review, uh, as Vicki mentioned, later this year and then hopefully awarded uh, early in 2023. Currently, there are, th are three collaborative research centers with some, as stated, collaborative projects in between. And that some of their main aims are listed here. The one center is at Columbia University led by Ian Lipkin, and he's been looking at metabolomics and epigenetics projects and really has found some metabolic pathway perturbations in MECFS patients when compared to controls that I think highlight some of the differences that were seen some years ago with uh, really foundational metabolomic studies from Bob Navio, um, as well as um, some similarities to uh, some work done by Maureen Hansen. Again, sort of validating the idea that we wanted centers that could collaborate and to some extent validate each other's findings uh, where possible. Another strength of these centers, I think, is some strong immunology um, really led by um, Durya Unamats at Jackson Labs who's identified differences in immune dysfunction related to length of illness and also um, potentially a correlation to gender and age. Um, and there's also a lot of microbiome expertise and the immune neuroimmune microbiome connection, of course, is of intense interest. And Maureen Hansen at Cornell University has uh, been supporting a variety of studies very productively. And that, and has been looking at exercise uh, testing and trying to understand the differences in two-day CPET studies in between males and females, and with an, also an emphasis on extracellular vesicles and single-cell RNA-seq studies. So it's very deep um, phenotyping that is still being analyzed, but I, already the preliminary data shows differences, and I think there's going to be a lot that will understand even in the next year um, from this group and some of the analysis. And then the fourth group is the data management coordinating group, which has really developed what, what I think and I think we think is a wonderful tool, MAP MECFS, that should only get more powerful as more and more data is put in there and, and is, as the tools to analyze that data will become uh, more readily available. And um, there's also a search MECFS um, engine that was developed by RTI, the Data Management Coordinating Center. And uh, there's a website there, of course, uh, to look for updates for any of these. Next slide. 
Can you go to the next one? Uh oh. There we go. So one aspect of the uh, collaborative research centers is that early on, I think within the first year, we established a nice collaboration with the laboratory of Elaine Moreau in um, Canada, where he has his ICANN CME research network, which you're probably familiar with, where we have, again, from the very beginning, have tried to share information and synergize in terms of what research projects were ongoing and really expertise. And it's it's been a nice collaboration and I hope uh, we can continue it because uh, Alan has really found some interesting microRNAs and, and has published on them, which I think are informing his own research as well as some of the work going on um, in the US-based collaborative research centers. So he has three pillars in his program, uh, which is really across uh, Canada, looking to fill existing gaps in ME-CFS research. Uh, really his center broadly, his network is developing a, a, a research infrastructure across the country and trying to integrate and standardize databases and biobanking. And then another uh, pillar for him is, is really to develop talent and training um, to for enhanced research capacity in the future. And I think another strength of his, which he probably wouldn't say on his slide, but I will, is that he also, as we do, incorporate uh, patient perspective into much of his work. Um, and I think it's a strength for him and for uh, our collaborative centers that have uh, patient, really patient partners um, involved in understanding uh, every, basically at every meeting where we update, we try and include um, the patient perspective because I think that's what we need to do. And it, and it actually improves the work um, and, and has been very valuable. I know Alan feels strongly about that as, as do Vicky and I, and that's why it's built into the uh, Collaborative Research Center uh, network. Next slide. So Vicky mentioned that our regular um, granting mechanism outside of the collaborative research uh, centers did have, uh, I think it was eight to $10 million annually, the budget prior, and it, those continue actually, and actually have increased a little bit over the last few years. And most of those applications are either on the proposed mechanisms, immune dysregulation, or even viral etiology, which would be assigned to my institute, the Allergy Immunology uh, uh, Institute, Infectious Disease Institute, or if they're looking at the neuroimmunology of um, really understanding the role of central nervous system inflammation on MECFS, they would, those grants if, would be assigned to Vicki's Institute and she would manage them. And those are on both on this slide. And, and we've just picked out uh, some of uh, representative projects from really the areas that I just mentioned, looking at things like exhausted T cells, uh, single cell immunology, long COVID as a subtype of, of uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS, which is actually a genetics study, which has just begun uh, from a group in Boston. And then also, um, Durya Unitmats, who I mentioned earlier, has had a longstanding grant looking at uh, immunological differences with MECFS. And again, the grants in the lower part here are really trying to understand this role of the central nervous system inflammation with um, people that you may, may know already, Jer Jared Younger, Tacoma Shungu, um, and Ben Nadelson, and actually Lenny Jason, who also has been in this field for some time and looking at maintenance and incidence of MECFS following uh, mononucleosis, um, including a more recent long COVID addition to his study. We can answer questions about these if folks have them. I'll, I'll just move on for now. Thank you. So I'm gonna spend just a few slides talking about the NIH Recover Initiative. Um, this is a, a, a large program that was started in January, 2021 with really four specific aims. 
That is to understand the clinical spectrum and biology underlying um, PASC or long COVID uh, over time to define risk factors, really understand incidence and prevalence since we didn't know at the outset um, and to start to understand distinct uh, sub phenotypes. And again, understand the pathogenesis and how it might relate to the many uh, organs uh, affected by um, SARS-CoV-2. And really what is spending, we're spending a lot of time on right now are identifying interventions for clinical trials to treat and hopefully prevent uh, PASC in the future. And this is a large effort that involves the private sector, patients and caregivers, researchers, and community partners, as well as uh, you know the, the federal partners across the US government. Uh, we, we, it's a national scale study trying to take into account a, a number of different populations um, across the United States um, to really understand the breadth and depth of the disease. And, and as I mentioned, design the clinical trials to help uh, intervene. Next slide, please. So the, really there are five pillars that, that are, are used for this work. The second one is the one that was initially uh, really of intense effort. And that is to set up a national cohort of about 40,000 participants um, including an adult cohort, a pediatric cohort, and also a pregnancy cohort um, to really, really try and understand some of the, of the burden of the disease and, of course, collect samples so that we could better understand it and develop assays so that we can test uh, interventions. Um, the middle core, actually, electronic health records was also something that was started very early and, and some early publications are now uh, coming out. We're looking at about 60 million health records, which also includes, I should mention, international partners. The cohorts, the prospective cohort is, is, is in the US, but the electronic health records does contain some international partners. Uh, pathobiology studies were launched this summer to really jumpstart some mechanistic studies of pathogenesis, particularly in PASC. Uh, my institute, as well as other institutes um, across NIH have awarded a number of studies looking at acute COVID, but, and then sometimes longitudinally, but really these studies were, were really designed to look at PASC and long COVID uh, specifically, and to understand that the very complex and diverse pathobiology and there's also an autopsy component uh, to this as well, to look at some tissue pathology and, and neuroimaging. The first, the first circle is actually the clinical trials, which are in active discussion. They were solicited last spring, and there are um, trials that are planned to start in the fall, and there are, are a number of master protocols underway. I should mentioned that uh, one question that often comes up is what is the role for MECFS in this um, network? When the original longitudinal protocol for collection of the cohort was uh, assembled, there were tools that were included so that if MECFS was a result of SARS-CoV-2 infection, it would be recognized. And actually that is even being improved over time with uh, protocol amendments to improve the ability to recognize MECFS as an outcome of SARS-CoV-2. And there's this more recent discussion of a proposed MECFS uh, cohort. But right now, what's in place is, a, is are the trial or the protocol tools to recognize the development of MECFS as a consequence. Uh, so that was certainly something that, that would we would want to have included for obvious reasons is that there's so much overlap as has been written in, in the public press for, for some time. Can you go to the next slide? So there are, right now, there are, there are two types of cohorts that are then funneled into tier one screening tests, which are very general, clinical functional tests, which are a little more detailed, and then some really advanced testing, which would be more akin to the, some of the deep phenotyping that Vicki mentioned 
that Avinath is doing. And again, this is on a national scale across a very large cohort. So of course it's a funnel. We're not gonna do that level of, of deep phenotyping on all, the, all uh, the patients in the cohort. So the design is so that we will have about 9,000 adults in an acute infection cohort and about 9,000 in a post-acute infection cohort. And then including others, as I mentioned, with uh, children as and including uh, pregnant persons in these uh, cohorts. And I should say that the post-acute cohort uh, enrollment is going very, very well. And the acute cohort has been more challenging with things like subsequent infection, for example, has been a complication that I think we, we may not have initially anticipated and the differences in those infections. You know, the now that the clear differences between an infection with the Delta strain versus um, subsequent Omicron strains, for example. Can you go to the next slide? So in terms of clinical trials, there, it was really, we, they were grouped into six different uh, symptom clusters, and then the interventions are addressing them. The very first one that is likely to be addressed is the viral persistence or reactivation um, and, and then also the immune dysregulation uh, clusters where the uh, interventional agents will be uh, in those areas. But we also have a, a suite of trials that are being uh, considered and in fact planned in the other areas mentioned here, dysautonomia, neurocognition, sleep, and then a, a cardiopulmonary exercise intolerance and fatigue. So, um, as I mentioned, their, their master protocols are being developed with input from experts all across the country, in fact, the world, and uh, a big presence of uh, patient partners and patient-defined outcomes in many cases. Um, next slide. So uh, this is my last slide. I just wanted to end. This is where information about recover can be found on recovercovid.org. And um, there's a listserv, of course. The funded projects that I mentioned, including the me mechanistic studies, are, are, are available to be seen here. And then, of course, updates as they're available. And I think um, I'll stop there and perhaps we can take questions. Oh, yeah, there's our contact information. Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's very interesting. Um, there are no submitted questions, but uh, I have some, so I hope it's okay if I try to ask mine. Sure. Uh, Joe, you, it's very interesting to hear about all the effort being made to solve long COVID. And following the discussion, I have seen some people are, have hope that uh, the similarities belong between long COVID and ME will mean that we will find some answers about ME as well studying long COVID, but other people are concerned that the much greater funding into finding answers about long COVID will pull researchers away from the ME field. How do you feel about this? And what is your perspective on it? I mean, my perspective is that we are, this effort, um, and unfortunately, the disease burden of, of long COVID PASC is, I think, increasing the understanding of MECFS in the research community because of the exposure of long COVID. I think it, I think it may draw people into the field who wouldn't otherwise know about MECFS. We've, we've frankly struggled to get people to come into the field. And I think we may get some collateral benefit of of folks who are pulled in to look at long COVID and the immune dysregulation and the fatigue and the neuroimmune complexes that are happening there and the clear overlap in symptoms with MECFS. The, some of the grants that I showed and, and the grants that we see coming in, they often have a, if it's an MECFS study, they might have a small long COVID component or they have both. If it's uh, really a long COVID study, we'll add MECFS as a comparator. So I, th I think it will benefit. It's not the same 
I, I agree, but I think that there there will be a benefit. And I think, you know, reviewing interventions that are addressing fatigue as an outcome, for example, I think, I, I hope, I can't predict it, that they will have a benefit. If, if it benefits the PASC population, those suffering from it, I would hope that, that it would act similarly on those with fatigue from MECFS. It'll have to be tested. Um, but I think that I, I see it as um, an unintended benefit of this program that it should address some of the things that just haven't, because of the scope of MECFS efforts, haven't been able to be addressed. Hey, Vicki, I don't know if you feel the same or different. Yeah, if I could comment, I think one of the unique benefits of the RECOVER initiative is that they are studying individuals with acute um, COVID who then transition into developing long COVID and they're collecting biospecimens all along the way. And, and then we'll be able now to look at the individuals with long COVID who either develop MECFS or do not. And so I think those biospecimens and the ability to look at what's happening in those earliest phases of that transition from an acute to chronic phase is going to be really critical in understanding what's going on not only in long COVID, but in MECFS. And we're already being contacted by people who are coming, have been studying long COVID and now want to move into studying MECFS. Um, we, got, we recently had a request for biospecimens from our MECFS biorepository from a long COVID researcher who wants to do the comparison. So I think it's, it's increasing the interest and in certainly going to increase the research on MECFS. And so I absolutely agree with Joe. That's good to hear. Um, Vicky, I was just wondering about the intramural study. I know a lot of people are very interested and impatient to see it published. So are um, we. <laughs> <laughs> could you say anything about how close you are to publication? Yeah, so um, yeah, everybody's very anxious to see the results. Joe and I saw preliminary results, probably now what, Joe? Oh my gosh, two years ago? Yeah. But that, those were very preliminary. Um, what I know is that the manuscript, the initial manuscript is finished, was being circulated amongst the authors and they were due to submit it for review for publication and this soon, and that was a month ago that we had that update. So we're very hopeful that it will get public out to pub, out for review and published as soon as possible. They've been very close to the chest about their results. They haven't even really shared their results with us internally. So um, yeah, we're all very anxious to see those results. Well, then I think there's no point in asking you for a peak preview, so. <laughs> <laughs> We would like to have one, but we don't haven't had one yet either. No, uh, but one thing I've been curious about is that um, due to the uh, pandemic, I've heard you only were able to include about half the patients you were originally planning to include. Uh, are there enough patients to give the results that you were hoping for? Yes, so my understanding talking to um, Dr. Nath and Wallet is that they did the analysis before they decided to stop any further studies and determined that they had enough data to, to, to have significance from the data that they had. You also mentioned biomarkers. Is there anything else you can say about that? I mean, it's the holy grail of uh, ME, isn't it, to be able to test and see if someone has a disease and also yes. for treatment studies it would be uh, crucial yes absolutely and i think what you'll see coming out of so the centers are now busy completing their data analysis and writing papers for publication and so for example the data that we've seen from maureen hansen's group where they collected biospecimens before and after the CPET test on day one and then again on day two is clearly showing significant differences in some different biomarkers 
um, before and after day one, and then again after day two, that we believe probably will likely be able to be used as biomarkers and may in fact be able to eliminate the day two part of that CPET test um, so that it would make it much easier for individuals to, to do that test and to be, and in the United States, it's required now to, in order to be able to claim disability. But I think as you indicated, I think some of those biomarkers could also be used to indicate progr disease, progression of disease, and then response to treatment. And so I think a lot of that data is going to come out of what we already are seeing in the centers. So it's very, very promising. What you were just saying, you know, reminds me of a quite interesting discussion at the uh, recent conference, the virtual conference, where they talked about um, exercise testing and provocation testing and what yes. the ethical side of it, that people became worse after exercise testing. So yes. it's um, it must be difficult for American patients if they have to go through a two-day test in order to get disability. Yes, and it's not covered by insurance. And so everyone has to pay out of pocket to get that testing. And we're actually, as part of our interagency, federal agency working group in the United States, working with the disability, social security disability folks who are very interested in having a much simpler way to be able to qualify someone for disability. So yeah, that would be a huge benefit from the research for individuals with ME. Okay, um, let me see if, uh, just one thing out of curiosity, Joe. Uh, do you know, do you have any numbers for how many get long COVID after a uh, COVID infection? So it depends on the population. The electronic health records data are different, for example, adults versus kids um, and age groups. But I think there's a, still a range, but I think it's falling, you know, closer to 20% um, so far. Um, that's data from the health records, not from the prospective collective study yet, because that's not complete. Um, so we don't really have that information yet, but the electronic health records have been, have been, and and there are others. I think the UK has done a lot of work in this area as well, and their data is all publicly available. And actually, we're we were we're we're connecting with them. There's a seminar as part of the recover. There's a collective seminar series, and I think the UK group is going to present some of their data in early October, and that's. That's all publicly available information on the Recover website. Um, so I think in the childhood population, it's it looks lower. It's a couple percent, it's, and I I don't know how f that's preliminary, but that, that's that's what I've seen so far. Um, and I, again, it depends on the population. But if I had to generalize, it's around twenty percent from from the electronic health records data so far. Okay. I think I've come to the end of the questions I had. Uh, I don't know. I have some other people from my organization here, Olav and Margareta. Do you have any questions? And you have to unmute if you want to ask them. No, nope. doesn't look like it. Um, I'm probably thinking a lot more questions I would have liked to ask when I, after I finish. So I hope we'll be able to ask you to come back later once the uh, intramural study has been published and we can, you can talk about it. And uh, then I will just have to say thank you so much for coming and sharing your information with us. And I will get this webinar edited and posted to YouTube and Facebook as soon as I possibly can. So uh, thank you and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.